All right, welcome. Here we're talking about suburban sprawl versus neo-traditionalism, um, and we're shooting towards designing a better infrastructure consumption, one that will primarily result in less fossil fuel consumption and maybe a little better social justice along the way. All right, so just a quick overview. If you think about older cities, like here we have an older European city, um, they tended to be pretty dense because they were designed before the car. And so they had to be walkable. And this makes it a lot easier to impose public transit kind of solutions like trains and buses because folks live near each other. Um, in a lot of post uh, 1950s America, we see sprawl where people have their um, big houses and their big yards. And um, there is not very good use of the uh, available land and so you've get a kind of development that makes it difficult to implement public transit like buses and trains and so you're going to get a lot more fossil fuel use and of course that's going to cause a lot of more greenhouse gases going into the environment so in this lecture we're going to think about how can we redesign cities so that they're more efficient um, so we live in a way that doesn't produce as much carbon All right, so some sprawl basics. Um, the short story is sprawl is a way of using land that sprawls out your infrastructure. So your roads and your sewer and your police and fire and all that kind of stuff. So that you also have a lot of more cars burning um, fossil fuels. So, um, there's a, all together it constitutes this massive infrastructure of consumption that does a lot to shape behavior and shape psychology as well. So one function of sprawl um, is oftentimes people don't ne live near people that are of different income status than they are. And so you get all kinds of crazy ideas about, for example, why people are poor, uh, because they're not really living in um, diverse environments with people from different economic backgrounds. Um, so you get all these consequences of race, class, ideology, isolation, materialism, which you might call the softer stuff. Um, we'll talk about that as well. Uh, but our key focus here is the pollution. So when you get the sprawl going on, you get these larger homes, more cars, and you have a lot of expense spent on infrastructure um, that um, leaves us less money for other things. So I just have a picture here of Metro Atlanta, which is one of the most sprawling um, cities in America, largely because it was developed um, so much post 1950s. Also, you had the white flight phenomenon. So there's social factors here that also drive uh, the consumption. But if you have a sprawled out city, you will definitely have traffic that's not only inconvenient, but um, causes a lot of pollution. Okay, so we're gonna examine some alternatives. Uh, we'll talk about traditional design. So here's another European city. Um, you can see lots of natural density. Um, Neo-traditional design, the stuff that Diwani's talking about. Here's an example of some denser developments organized around a courtyard. And then we'll also talk about transit-oriented development. So if Diwani's kind of talking about how you design a neighborhood, Transit or in development is kind of thinking about how you design a cluster of cities or a cluster of small towns and connecting them with some kind of efficient mass transit. Okay, so some learning goals. Um, I'll talk about the basics of sprawl and um, why density matters and the kind of um, public transportation options that open um, when you get more density. Um, we'll talk about, Duane has five key characteristics of sprawl and there's five key um, principles of neo-traditional design. We'll talk about uh, that transit-oriented development um, and also spend a little bit of time talking about the psychology of sprawl. So as you might not be surprised, um, whether or not somebody's riding to ride a bus kind of depends on who they see as riding that bus. So you get these issues of class, class racism, and um, um, people being scared of people that look different or might be of different um, income status. 
And then um, we'll spend a little time to just connecting it to some of our systems theory principles, um, especially the idea of synergy. Okay, your outline, um, different sections we're gonna go through. We'll start here with the overview of suburban sprawl, just to kind of give you a sense of what we're talking about. Okay, so example one, um, this is Baltimore, 1900. You can see that most of the people live, red dots are people, live inside of Baltimore. You can see there's probably some people living here. I suspect these are um, train lines. Um, so some people living on those. Um, 1920s, you can see from 1900 to 1920, most of the development occurs within the city. Um, but when you get to 1960, you notice the difference there. Um, people are moving out into the hinterland, uh, more spread out, uh, largely because cars have become more available. And then 1997, you know, the countryside virtually disappears and there's people everywhere. Um, so huge transformation there. Then you can also see this in um, Rock Hill. Oh, sorry, let me say about Baltimore. Um, but some key things to notice there, um, you've got, um, you know, the impact of the car, lots of consumption of the countryside, commute times would go up and you can imagine greenhouse gases go way up since a lot of those people are gonna be commuting. Um, next, we'll look at Rock Hill. Let me just quick point out one thing. If you, this is a building in downtown Rock Hill, but if you look at the kind of details you see on these structures, um, there's a, an interesting thing in that they have them. Um, if you go to a Best Buy, a Best Buy is meant to be encountered at 60, 70 miles an hour. You see some flash of blue and yellow and you're like, honey, there's a Best Buy, let's get a television. But um, if you're encountering a building at the you know space of, Oh, sorry, as a pedestrian, you have time to notice details. So it really focus, it changes their physical built environment when um, things aren't designed for pedestrians. Okay, now this might shock you, but there was a point in time where there were people in downtown Rock Hill. It looks like people once sold cotton um, in downtown Rock Hill. Go figure. Um, so it used to be that that was the center of Rock Hill. Things have changed. So if this is downtown Rock Hill here, oops, that's not the pen I want. Let's try this. If people are in downtown Rock Hill, now I would suggest most of the action is um, over here or up here on um, Selenese. Um, so what's happened? So largely the interstate that came in in the 50s really has redefined the town um, and kind of killed off the downtown and pulled most of the development out to um, the interstate. So um, if you look at here, if you think about it, you can figure out what it was that the town was originally organized around. Um, it had these grid-like streets and they were all indexed off of this railway line uh, that bisected the town this way. Um, that has all changed now because this new infrastructure has changed the way the town is oriented. So when they originally put in interstates, they didn't think about the social and geographical effect they'd have on cities, um, but it's huge. Um, and they've had a, a big impact, not always for the best. Um, because you end up with things like this. So this is Galleria Place, um, and you'll notice that um, it is not exactly a walkable environment. So if I am shopping over here, and this has happened to me before, if you're shopping at Lowe's and you want to go to Walmart, you could take your life in your hands and try to cross this road, but it's not really designed for that. It's designed for a lot of car use. So this is the kind of um, car-based development that we see in um, Sprawl. Okay. Um, you can also look at Charlotte. So Charlotte um, now has a ring that goes all the way around um, Charlotte. And you might be surprised that this ring gets, con uh, you might not be surprised now that you've read Duwani, but this will get congested um, even though it's really recent because of this phenomenon of induced demand. So um, you have all kinds of people building houses out farther here, counting on being able to um, use the interstate system to get around. And of course, um, that produces a lot of pollution and it's not terribly efficient. And you have this phenomenon when, when these new sections of 45 opened, they were already congested. 
And you can look more closely at Charlotte to see where the grid system started and where it actually broke down. So if you look in um, downtown Charlotte here, you'll see a lot of that, um, that grid system that we've, um, that Duwani talks about. Let me change colors here. Um, and then Dilworth was one of the first um, suburbs. You wouldn't think of it as a suburb now, but it was back then. And you had some variation on the uh, basic grid pattern, but it's still fairly grid-like. So it enables people to take different routes and it manages traffic better, but it doesn't take long. And it, it's kind of like tree rings, right? Like the farther out you go, the older, the more recent they are. Um, it doesn't take very long until you have that all break down where, um, and especially I'm not showing it here, but once you get past this woodlawn route four, this is all post 1950s development and it is the land of sprawl. Um, so you can see this transformation in our cities in terms of how they were structured and how that has changed. Okay. So we're going to hit now, um, sprawl versus the neo-traditional design that Duwani recommends. Um, just a quick snapshot here. You can see how sprawl is encroaching on this farmland and open space. Um, not terribly efficient use of space, a lot of private space. Um, and Duwani is recommending that we think more of these kind of options where you have, um, denser developments, uh, where more people are packed in, um, in smaller spaces. Now that might sound bad, but when you have more people in a smaller space, there's more opportunities for um, public transit. And there's also more chance you'll have different kinds of amenities like grocery stores and coffee shops. Um, so there's a trade-off, but there's lots of good stuff about living in these kinds of environments as well. Okay. So Duwani, um, he was an architect and city planner. Um, he's kind of a character. Um, this was, a I think it might be Coral Gables, I forget, but it's a, a community in Florida that he worked on that gets all these rave reviews. Um, he wrote this book with these other folks. It's now a little older, but the principles still work. So, um, and I do a disservice to his authors. I always just talk about him um, just cause I'm lazy. Okay, so this was a fascinating little um, thing. If you noticed in the front of Duwani's book, um, I think this is like in the preface. Um, he pulls this quote from Lee Cabuzier, who is this uh, modernist architect who wanted to design basically these really tall size skyscrapers where people would live. And then there would be nature around them and they would just get around on a minimal set of roads. Um, but it was this idea that he was going to kill the street. So people would be able to um, not have to deal with street life and all the nitty grittiness of that. So here he says, the cities will be part of the country. I shall live 30 miles from my office in one direction under a pine tree. My secretary will live 30 miles away from it too in the other direction under another pine tree. We shall both have our own car. We shall use up tires, wear out road surfaces and gears, consume oil and gasoline, all of which will necessitate a great deal of work enough for all. So this is from his 1967 Radiant City. So what Duwani's pointing out here is there was this modernist dream that we could do better than traditional design that has largely gotten us into a lot of trouble. Um, and it's not turned out as we expected. So when you read this, you realize this is kind of pre environmental consciousness where he's talking about, um, there's some kind of, there's references to nature as things that you're going to live under, um, pine trees, but, um, seem unconcerned that you're driving 30 miles and it's going to wear out stuff, but he's primarily saying that's just going to be a great deal of work. It's going to be a social benefit because there'll be all these jobs. He's not thinking about the environmental cost. He's not um, recognizing how uh, that distrib distribution of people over a landscape is going to take a huge amount of resources that's hard on the planet. All right, so Duwani's picking on him and saying this is not really utopia because... It turns out like this, that we have um, a phenomenon of all kinds of uh, congestion and um, ugly signs. And um, it's not exactly the, the pretty image that um, Cabuzier was promoting. Okay, so Duwani lays out five elements of sprawl. Now, these are not design principles, but it's just kind of what happens. Um, well, some of them are, are things you strive for, but it's 
not necessarily somebody sets out to create all five of these things. Okay, so what's going on? You have this strict segregation of different functions. So you have housing subdivisions, and within those housing subdivisions, you have some areas that where homes are from a certain price point to another certain price point. And God forbid somebody move into the neighborhood and build a smaller house because it's going to hurt all those property values. So it's a very um, utilitarian kind of modernist division of the world into different sectors um, where there's not a lot of natural interaction among different pieces. A lot of segregation allowed along function lines and along um, economic lines. And then you also get um, everything being shopping centric. Uh, you get these strip malls. If you go to a McDonald's now, it is just an amazing institution that is organized around the car. Um, stick your head in one if you never go to them and look at the the um, computers and the way they time things. But it's all about trying to get those cars through as quickly as possible. And the whole building is organized around it. Um, which makes for a little less pleasant environment for pedestrians. Um, talks about office parks. So we had this idea like, hey, let's take the office out of downtown and put it in a park, which sounds great, but it's hard to go out for lunch. It's hard to run errands because it's disconnected from everything else. There's no synergy. Um, he also parts out that oftentimes your major civic institutions, places where people come together, your churches and your schools are kind of stuck away in corners and they're not really um, focal points for the community. And then there's um, roadways are designed with one goal in mind, getting people through quickly. Um, if that's your goal, that is going to sacrifice some other things in terms of, is that street pleasant to walk on? Would you like to spend time there? Can you accomplish some of your business by foot as opposed to always having to get into a car? Um, Okay, and then um, I'm just going to highlight here that there's some of these additional issues that um, come up that you get with the sprawl design, namely the congestion. I talked about the induced traffic, income segregation, and just a lot more trips because everything's spread out. All right, so these are some nice diagrams that help you visualize the differences in the um, different um, designs. So in the conventional or the sprawl kind of design, you notice several things going on. Um, the school is kind of set over here to the side. It's not really in a place of prominence. And if kids who live in these houses want to go to school, they have to encounter the main artery road. And so most kids are not going to walk to school, even if they're close, because of the way, because the lack of the grid, the lack of connectivity. And so you get a huge amount of car use in terms of taking kids um, to school. So that's expensive. Um, you also don't have kids having the ability to just navigate a physical environment and walk to school, which is probably good for them. You have the segregation between apartments in one spot and houses in another spot. Um, that's economic segregation and also probably some racial segregation too. Any business to survive has to be located on the main artery so people will see it. And then you have the mall with all kinds of space devoted to parking. And again, it's kind of hard to walk to because of the where it's set up. Okay, so segregation by function, segregation by income, a main artery, and not secondary roads that you could use. All right, in contrast, um, Duane's traditional neighborhood design or neo-traditional design, um, you have um, a center, a clearly defined um, place that uh, represents, um, golly, what's going on with my marker? Um, you have a, a center um, that gives people some sense of they're in this neighborhood and not that neighborhood. So you might have uh, governance structures, like you think of um, small towns, oftentimes like have a courthouse in the middle of the square. Um, or you can think about a church or some other buildings that you could be organized around. Um, there's this goal for a five minute walk, because if people can accomplish something in five minutes, they're likely not to get in their car. So in other words, if they can go and pick up some aspirin at a drugstore or pick up a book from the library or, or do some of their errands without um, getting in a car, it's going to cut down on traffic and pollution. There's a network of streets. There's a grid. Um, it makes it more interesting and useful. And also there's different routes to take places so you can accommodate more people better. Um, and then um, 
you have these narrow versatile streets that allow different kinds of functions and are more friendly towards pedestrians and then you have mixed use so the um different buildings um, will have different functions in them and you can have different functions that are located next to each other so for example you might have some housing next to some retail or something like that kind of unspoken in all this is you're designing first and foremost with the pedestrian in mind like how can you make this a pedestrian friendly environment get people out of their cars all right so what does that look like in practice well um you might still have an artery road, but you have, notice, you have these secondary roads um, that, that people can get on uh, that will allow them to bypass congestion on the main road. Also, you can have businesses that are located off the main road because they know people are going to be on this secondary road as well. You'll notice that there's apartments here but they're within walking distance of homes. So there's not the strict segregation and you can do some nice things with, you know, giving some green spaces. So even though those folks may not have their own private, um, backyards, they still have some green space they can enjoy. Um, kids can walk to school right here. School. Um, there's numerous routes that they can take to get there so they can get a little variety and exercise. And you'll notice the school kind of is the, at, at the end of the, these two roads. So there's a, if you were driving on these roads, this would be a terminating vista. You would look and you would see the school. So it's kind of nice. You have some sense that the school is important and it's at the center of the community and you know where it is, et cetera. Okay. And then just one other side note, since you have, it's easy for these different people to drive on these roads, routes, you have this thing called eyes on the street. So there's less likely to be crime because there's always going to be people coming by your house. You have mixed use in that the houses are near to the re retail and offices. Um, so, um, some people at least could conceivably walk from home to the store or other things. So some functions or some errands can be accomplished without getting in a car. Okay, so now I'm just gonna run through some examples of some specific features. So this is Portland, Oregon versus Walnut Creek, California. You see this nice dense network of um, streets and over here, um, you don't. So in Walnut Creek, it's hard to walk anywhere. It's hard to take the bike to work because there's not very many through streets. Whereas over here, it's all through streets. So it's very easy to get around. Um, and there's, um, makes it a lot more bike and pedestrian friendly. Um, with the conventional design, you have these strips that I kind of think about Eden Terrace near the Coliseum, where you can just zip through at any speed, um, because there's really nothing to slow you down. So you have uh, but it's not very inviting to walk. The The sidewalk, for example, is right up against the street, so kids aren't going to feel safe. I'm not going to feel safe. Um, in the traditional kind of way of designing it, um, you have a sidewalk that has a buffer between there and the street with some plantings, what some people call a planting strip. And you're going to have on-street parking, which will um, do some traffic calming for you, slow down some cars, and the streets are generally going to be narrower so that will naturally cause people to drive slower, pedestrians feel more safe, etc. So cul-de-sacs are this double-edged thing where people like living on a cul-de-sac because there's less traffic. But the more cul-de-sacs you have, the less through streets you have. So when you do get on a major street, it's got a lot of traffic on it. So you're really kind of just pushing the traffic from one place to another place and it ends up making it a lot harder, say, for kids or elderly people to get around because they don't have cars. Um, and you can also see, just because of the wonkiness of the, the, the loopiness of it, what some people call a dead worm design. Um, if Johnny, Johnny here wants to play with Amari over here, it's a little hard because um, the, there's not the connectivity that you would like. Okay, so in general, with the um, the roads, they're designed for throughput, so they can carry maximum traffic. But then if you're a poor pedestrian, it's really hard to navigate this environment. And here's another thing. Since people are in their cars, there's an incentive for signs to be really tall, large, and gaudy to get people's attention. Um, you've noticed maybe on Cherry Road, they've controlled that more in recent years, and there's a sign ordinance where they can't be a certain height. And if you might... At least when I experience now, I feel a lot less stressed driving on the road because I'm not getting yelled at by all the large billboards and signs. So you can do better than this. 
All right, snout houses. So because we're so obsessed with cars, uh, most of the, the cars really dominate our neighborhoods. Uh, I'll show you in a, in a minute some alleys as a way uh, to redesign some of this, but um, it makes it so you really don't have a front of the house. You just have a garage that's kind of doming it. The, from a functional perspective, the problem is it really breaks up the flow of the street. Anytime somebody has to walk by open concrete like that, it makes the environment less pleasant and they're less likely to go for the walk. Okay, you tend to get, um, Duwani talks about these monocultures. All these houses are the same size, so you're gonna likely have people all of the same income, which makes it kind of hard to support diversity. Say like a grandmother that wants to stay in the neighborhood that she raised the family in. She no longer needs the big house, but there's no smaller houses in this neighborhood. So you get this economic segregation thing, and you'll see this on the interstate. You'll see signs that say, from the low 200s or from the mid 300s. Um, and you have to turn to your spouse and say, honey, what are we? Are we a low 300 kind of family or a high 500 kind of family? Um, and so these pods that you get in are very homogeneous in terms of the kinds of houses and who's in them. And Dewan is suggesting that's not good for democracy and all that stuff. The land use, um, it sucks up a lot of land because you have a lot of land you have to devote to parking. And you'll get phenomenons like Walmarts um, that move to maybe build a super Walmart, leaves a store that's really hard to retrofit into anything else. So uh, it doesn't, you'll see in a second here, but the neo-traditional design specifies the way buildings are set up in relation to the street so that there's a lot of more flexibility in terms of who can occupy that building. Um, and as Duane talks about in the book, people are, they design parking lots so that they're full only one day a year on Black Friday before Christmas. And in the meantime, that just wastes a lot of land that's not really doing anything for you. And it's a hideous environment for a pedestrian. Office parks are segregated from residential areas. So these poor saps um, have a hard time walking anywhere. These people can't walk here because everything's broken up. Um, Duwani picks on the Virginia Beach, quote, model intersection um, where you have so many lanes, traffic doesn't back up. But from a pedestrian standpoint, would you want to walk around here? Like you feel like you're in a barren wasteland, right? And the curb radii are such that to get from here to here, you might need a calendar to track how long it's going to take you. So it's exposing you to a lot of traffic. So designed around the car, not the pedestrian. Um, similarly, you'll get this, um, what he calls a low hierarchy design where there's these arterial roads that connect things, but there's no specifications of what happens in these different zones, these different pods. And so everything dumps onto this artery. And so it's always congested. So if you're in Pineville, Pineville's Matthews 15501 or whatever it is, that is always backed up. doesn't matter what time of day you go. And the throughput design, you have these wide looping kind of roads so you don't have to break or come to an intersection. But if you think about the amount of land that this takes up, it's enormous, right? And this isn't really enough, you know, it's these small little slices that you can't really support wildlife, you can't put businesses here. So uh, these interstates just take up a lot of space. Duwani talks about little things like the curb radii. They are designed for the convenience of drivers. So you can take this thing at 35, 50, whatever, um, you can tell this is a little dated, right? This is, uh, I think this is a Chevette. You missed out on this one. Uh, but anyway, the curb radii are such that you can go fast around it, but then the pedestrian has to encounter that fast traffic and it's a longer walk from one corner to the next when you're exposed to traffic. Um, Tawani also talks about how fire trucks have gotten bigger because, you know, men like big toys. So they've had to reconstruct, um, streets to be wider which is you know causes more traffic fatalities and all that but you know at least we can have big fire trucks okay so traditional design is an alternative i just want to highlight you know some places in europe that are dense but i don't think you would say that they're ugly so this is uh, a village in cinque terre it's these five little cities or villages along the coast um and there's some density here but it's very pretty or then Florence, um, so it's dense, right? You have these um, buildings that are packed in here, but it's still very pretty and attractive to tourists. So what kind of elements are here that Duwani wants to um, 
preserved. So one thing is you can look at some of these streets. There's just, um, they're very walkable, right? They're narrow. You feel safe. Um, you can get, use them for bikes. Um, there's different shops you can have, um, but it's on a human scale and it supports, you can have a lot of cute businesses. Um, these awnings make you feel like you're in a protected kind of space. Um, here's some examples from America. So this is Annapolis, uh, an older city that has um, some, uh, you know, the, some of the things Duani would recommend, like all the buildings are pulled up to the curb. Um, so you have this solid face of buildings that makes it feel more continuous. Um, Boston, um, you have these old kinds of um, mansions that are... Um, form a straight line uh, so that it feels like it's contiguous. So here's a more modern scene, but let's look and see what kind of design elements are here. So you have the awnings, which give you that sense that you're protected from the elements. I suspect that's kind of an evolved preference that there's something you know you can duck under if you need to. Um, the height of the buildings relative to the street it gives this kind of cozy feel. There's barriers here. These trees and these benches protect separate the sidewalk from the street. So it feels more um, defined. And uh, there's some planters here that are used to create a kind of buffer between the people at the restaurant and the sidewalk. Um, the, the way they use colors and plants really makes the environment a lot more uh, inviting. There's some thematic elements where the, the rectangular red brick here um, is tied into the moldings around the windows. Um, so a lot of neat stuff going on that's making this an environment that you would like to walk in. Okay, so one of the things that Duani talks about is these codes to specify certain things like where the buildings have to be in relationship to the street. And you can specify codes where the buildings have to be X number of feet away so they can't be set back. Parking has to be behind or somewhere else. And um, they can have to have windows and doors. Um, and you can specify the separation between those. That way it makes it so somebody feels safe walking on the street um, and they're not walking by barren lots or buildings that are pushed way back. So here's just out of a, uh, a manual, like how you set up some of these codes, but you'll notice that um, they're specifying that you have to access the storefronts from the street, not from the side or inside hallways. Um, you need to locate the entries to the upper floors somewhere on this um, street as well, not, not behind. So it gives your street a lot of visibility and traffic with pedestrians. Then there's some neat little features where if you set back the upper floors just a little bit, it makes it feel like the building's not quite as tall and makes it feel a little more um, small towny. And then there's specifications of the kind of molding and whatnot, but you can do all this so that you're, your whole development takes on a very consistent feel and it's one that makes people feel safe and invited. Um, proportion's a big thing for Duwani. Um, in these kind of flat open terrains, people don't feel protected, but if the buildings are at a certain height relative to the street, they um, feel kind of protected like they're in this living room environment. And again, you just here's another shot of buildings built up to the street with windows and doors facing onto the street as opposed to um, in the back or um, off to the side. So it, it makes people feel comfortable walking on that street. Um, so some other design elements here, I mean, notice the repetition, notice the consistent setback, um, notice the planting strip, um, the porches. There's lots of things to make this street feel like the place you'd want to walk on. Um, you notice there's no cars here in the front. It's more walkable. There's an alley in the back where the cars are located. So some more design features in terms of the sidewalk. Um, so you see like this is on the curb versus off the curb. On the curb, you feel kind of vulnerable, exposed to the cars. Instead, put the trees in a planting strip in between here. Um, and you can have a certain kind of width specified and all this kind of stuff. Um, alleys are part of Duane's design, um, a way of getting cars off of the areas where you want people to walk. So, um, this is a joke here. This is not terribly exotic because we used to have a lot of alleys, um, but it's where kids can play and the cars can park. 
It's where you can put the trash and the utilities to get that stuff off the main street. And here's a neat feature. You can have um, garages with apartments overneath. So if you, if you detach the garage from the house, then you can put somebody else in there that's of a different family and it, it doesn't feel like you have strangers living with you. Um, n- numerous advantages to this. One, you get a little more density because you get some more people that can live there. Um, two, you get some economic and social diversity. So for example, I had a friend who was a graduate student. Um, no, wait, she, she was just out of graduate school, didn't have a lot of income. So, but she could afford to live in a neat neighborhood because she was in one of these over garage units. Um, these are like studio apartments. And I think about my mother who had to move out of the neighborhood that she raised a family in because there wasn't any space for her in that kind of neighborhood. This accommodates people that have different means and different family sizes. Okay, as you increase density, you get less vehicle trips, right? Um, So there's more walking that goes on as density goes up and you get less trips. So that makes sense. So in other words, there's an empirical relationship here. Um, Density really does make people get out of their cars more. Um, And as you might suspect with that, um, in denser cities like San Francisco, people walk more. And so they tend to be less overweight relative to people like in Memphis, who are always having to get into their cars. This I love because it just gives you a visual demonstration of how much less congestion you have when people are taking public transit. So these, all these cars, if you have just one individual in them, would fit in just one bus. So a lot uh, more efficient to move people around in public transit. And then just to refresh your memory, we talked before about bus rapid transit, um, the transmillennial in Colombia, um, Venezuela. Um, You have uh, the cars, uh, the buses um, getting the middle lane here and able to carry a lot of people. Um, So once you have density, this kind of public transportation becomes a lot more doable. All right, just a quick detour into Charleston. Uh, do you want to talk some about Charleston? And it gives you some neat examples of uh, traditional design. Um, so here in the original charter, you can see the grids laid out. Um, Google also can show you the same um, in the historic area, the same basic grid pattern. Um, you get these streets that are narrow and versatile, like the, the ratio of the height of the buildings to the street makes it feel like you're protected and it's, um, they have these awnings and uh, it's a very uh, on-street parking to buffer you from the street as a pedestrian. Um, there's a standardization of where the buildings are. So there's a minimal setback to keep the buildings pushed up to the street, which creates this continuity of the form as you go down the block. So um, you have a, a standardized kind of experience. And buildings can be repurposed because of where they're located. Um, They're not uniquely designed. It's not like a Walmart in a big parking lot. So this originally was a church, but in the time since I've lived in this area, this has turned over numerous times and been different kinds of restaurants, a candy store, um, different kinds of things. Um, This is, we stayed once um, with some family in a little um, carriage house at one of these um, larger homes. And there's just a number of little things that I've noticed to make the density feel more, uh, to still have a sense of privacy, even though it's dense. So here's a church that's located right next door, but you can see with the hedge, it doesn't quite feel, um, it feels like you still have some privacy. Or here's the separation between where you park your cars and the um, there's, the backyard there's a little trellis here this is a really sweet honda accord i wonder who was driving that um and then they do this fake front door thing where um, there's these porches um where you're gonna have some private space but you have a door on the front um that looks like a front door but it just opens onto the portico i think you call it or these little gates or decorated gates but there's ways of even in that density making it feel that you still have some privacy um, and I think if I'm, if I've been told correctly, there's kind of a norm where if you're on your balcony here, 
you are not going to um, have to interact with strangers on the street that people kind of respect the privacy of somebody on these balconies. Um, these actually, if you just FYI, were an early form of air conditioning. So it was a space where the air could cool in before it would go into the house. Um, so there's a whole history of porches. Um, this is my wife. She's just um, stolen some stuff. She's looking around for the authorities. Um, but the point here is it works for modest houses too, right? This is not a big house, but the same thing. Uh, you can get a little privacy with this fake front door. Um, some other things in Charleston you see, this is when Duane talks about a terminating vista. So when you're driving on the street, it doesn't just go on forever. It terminates in a public building, a church. Um, and you'll also notice that the parking structure conforms to the same rules that the buildings do. So there's this awning kind of thing that makes it feel a little smaller and more intimate. Um, and these windows mimic the windows you would see in a normal building. So it blends right in because its form conforms to the same standards that other buildings do. Uh, in time out, but this, this is different than if you had just an open parking spot um, or a lot that people had to walk by. But when you walk by this, you still feel like you're on the same street, you're in the same safe environment. New buildings can conform um, to the standards, but just with a different style. So this doesn't look like an old building, but you see the way it's related, it's how it's built in relation to the street and its access to the street is standardized and it conforms. You also get a lot neater architecture because people are encountering stuff at that um, human scale um, and you have this blending of public and private space. See how the church extends over the sidewalk. Um, same thing here in this house. So it's just, it's a people, it's a way of living where you're a little more comfortable with the public and the private being close to each other and you don't need your own separate fiefdom. Um, and then you have, um, this is, I think they're called like the four corners of government. Um, anyway, it's a famous intersection in the historic part of Charleston. I like it because it shows my wife has found a fence to get rid of her stolen goods. And she's standing under a sign that says broad. The grid that you find in um, Charleston supports not only pedestrians, but like horses. So um, it's an area that can accommodate a lot of different people and not and still not get congested because of that grid network and um, gives you a lot of options in terms of how to get around. Okay, next section here, just gonna show you two cases where you can transform a street. So you've got like an arterial, arterial road here that's very car centric and bad for pedestrians. So we're gonna make some changes to it. So first of all, imagine what it would look like if you plant some trees. So trees give shelter and shade and make it a lot more inviting for you to walk, um, different aesthetic. Then if you add some buildings that have some height, that makes this space feel more de um, defined. You have these awnings and these little um, tables outside that make people feel like they're invited. You have a defining structure here. You have a parking garage that's structured um, so that it blends into the, the streetscape. Um, you add a light rail, so less cars. You make the street narrower. It's safer for pedestrians to cross. And you have more modes of transportation to get some cars off the street. So just summary, in this low density development, you've got these wide, high speed streets and narrow sidewalks, and it's kind of a single use district. Whereas when you put in the infrastructure um, for neo-traditional stuff, you get, um, this is TOD, we'll talk about that in a, in a second here, but transit oriented um, development. So in other words, there's a bunch of development that will be supported by this streetcar. Um, you've got bike lanes, you've got a bigger pedestrian friendly area, and you've got mixed uses here. You've got residences next to businesses. So it's not all just the same stuff. That's going to help decrease traffic and put people on the street at different times of day to keep the area safe. And then another transformation here, notice the width of the street relative to the sidewalk. So if you make the sidewalk bigger and the street narrower, that makes it a lot more inviting to be on the street. Then if you add some awnings and some trees, some buildings of a, a taller height, um, gives it a very different feel very quickly. 
Okay, so the psychology of sprawl and resistance to density. So I'm not gonna spend a ton of time on this, but since this is a psych class, I just wanna mention a few things here. Um, okay, so you can see how expressive individualism and utilitarian individualism make sprawl more likely. So expressive individualism can drive it in that people wanna have a car and a home that expresses themselves. And there's a big element of utilitarianism in sprawl. People wanna have a big house that they can keep a lot of stuff in. They like the cars cause it's convenient and it's the car is the ultimate kind of utilitarian individualism vehicle because you can go where you want at any time you want um, in the in, at the kind of speed you want. Um, so you can see how those are very attractive to motivating sprawl. But of course, it's not just individual choices. There's this wider phenomenon where people, developers and others can make a lot of money by putting in these developments that um, don't cost as much to build as some of the stuff that Duane recommends and um, get profits from that. And then, but they're imposing these long-term public costs. In other words, they're imposing these infrastructure costs and these maintenance costs of all these roads that are gonna have to be built to get out to these far flung spots. So there's a huge element where the political economy and capitalism um, is driving some of this dynamic. But you also have, um, there's some cultural dynamics too. Um, when you integrated the schools, you had this white flight phenomenon um, where people um, uh, left to seek out more racially homogenous communities and that's still with us today. Um, and I'll just point out that some of those, some of that um, presents some barriers to density. So there's a difference between public and private investment. So Duani's kind of model is that you invest in some public goods, some transportation systems, and some parking decks, and things that make the public space nicer, but that means we might have to have higher taxes, and so people can't have homes that are quite as big. Um, there's also kind of a trade-off with privacy. So you may have a, a little less space, a little less privacy, but you might have some other things that make up for that, like not as long a commute and less pollution. Um, people really like their cars, so trying to get people out of cars is, is tough. And plus there's a whole mix of racial class ideology issues that we'll touch on in a few weeks here that go with density. But I just, here's a, just a snapshot of some people at a bus station. Um, if you just look, um, it has a certain kind of urban feel to it and you have different kinds of people of different races. Um, some folks are gonna be hesitant to get on public transportation because of some, um, some issues they have with diversity so there's that's part of trying to overcome that's something that uh you need to overcome as well if you want to have some of these denser developments also interestingly enough denser areas tend to be more democratic um, and rural areas uh, less dense areas tend to be more um republican so some of, there's a lot of things going on here but you really do have this cultural divide that's opened up a lot more in recent years uh, where for whatever reason, um, it's a lot more likely that people that um, are living in urban areas are, are Democrats. So what's, um, so at least one thing that's going on is your traditional uh, minorities are more likely to be living in inner cities because of uh, restrictions and housing um, that happened in the past. Um, this is your um, systemic uh, racism kind of thing. And you have um, other factors at work, but uh, one factor is Republicans, uh, conservatives tend to prefer being in the exurbs. Uh, in part, one could guess because some of this racial diversity um, is a little threatening to them. Um, what's interesting though, is you'll find this split even in small towns. So um, if you look at Marshall, Iowa, or Marshalltown, Iowa, the blue area, the downtown area tends to go more democratic in some of the less populated parts of town and the area surrounding town is more likely to go Republican. So this is, it's fractal, which means it, it scales from all kinds of difference from big cities like Chicago down to small areas in the Midwest, um, like this town in Iowa. All right, but you can do these maps of any town. I couldn't find one of Rock Hill, but this is Greenville, South Carolina. You can see the urban core is more democratic relative to the suburbs. Uh, this is uh, 
who voted for whom in the 2016 presidential election. And then you can see here in Charlotte, there's this huge blue area. Uh, Charlotte is more democratic town, but the whole uh, area has a lot of, um, sorry, in the exterior areas, the suburbs, you have a lot more Republicans. Um, this used to be, this is in the area of town, South Charlotte. This is wider than the other parts of town. Um, this is the 2016 presidential election. Usually that area shows up red, but this was the one where Trump was running. So I think that might have, um, might have converted some people to Democrats for that election cycle. But anyway, it shows the same pattern. Okay, and just to mention, well, like I said, we'll hit this a little later in the course, but there's these huge social issues, everything to do with social justice and down to what democracy looks like on the ground that have to do with city design. So whether people have access to housing, schools, jobs, oftentimes that boils down to where they live, um, what part of town they're in. And there's this desire for racial homogeneity you get from some folks and desire for diversity, and that will play out in all kinds of different ways in terms of structuring uh, the where people get to live. So city design has a lot to do with democracy, whether or not it really happens in practice. And this isn't a history course, but just to um, make a plug here, history really matters. So racial segregation is something that was done very intentionally um, and with the support of government. Um, government, in my view, is kind of co-opted by different interest groups to do that. But um, it did not, segregation did not happen by accident. There's a long history of white privilege where, so the redlining prevented the accumulation of, redlining prevented African Americans from getting loans, which still is with us today when you look at the wealth of whites versus the average wealth of blacks. Um, blacks tend to not have as much wealth and it goes back to um, some of these structures that were in place about who could live where in a city and who could get loans for a mortgage. And then much of the civil rights struggle um, is related to city design. If you think about Brown versus the Board of Education saying that separate is not equal and we have to integrate our schools. Well, the reason the schools weren't integrated is because people lived in different parts of town. There was segregation. So, and again, we'll hit on this a little bit later in the course, but there is this white innocence um, and this kind of colorblind neutralism that refuses to recognize some of this history. Um, and that's something I think an educated person can get past. Okay, from a systems theory perspective, just want to point out a few things. If you compare this to the dancing exercise we did, you can think about sprawl as kind of the shake your booty dancing. You can do whatever you want. There's no rules, but then you end up with some lack of synergy. With neo-traditional and transit-oriented development, you get these... Um, certain rules that are imposed, like the way the building has to relate to the street uh, that we talked about before. So one way of thinking about it is sprawl gives you a negative kind of freedom. The individual has more choice, but the public kind of suffers. Whereas with some of these neo-traditional design elements or what we'll talk about here in a second, the transit oriented development, you get this positive freedom where you have to, things have to conform to a certain design standard, but in the end, it makes the whole community stronger. So, and there's also some synergy. That's another one of our systems theory uh, principles. So when you mix different buildings together, homes over retail, for example, um, you get some similarities to the kinds of uh, richness and diversity that Wes Jackson was talking about in terms of polyculture, agriculture. So you can think about the city as an ecosystem and how you want to have different pieces blend together. And you can just think about from a systems perspective, like what kind of city design would mimic nature? What, what are some design principles we could look to from nature? Um, and then think about, there's some value issues here and do we optimize for the whole or do we optimize just for individual choice outside of any broader context? Okay, almost done. Just wanna hit transit oriented development. This is kind of stepping up a level of scale from where Duwani's at and saying, okay, you can have these different urban areas, um, but ideally they would be dense urban areas, um, but connected by transit. So you kind of get the best of both worlds in that you have this dense area, but there's green spaces in between, right? So it's not just one big, huge city. Um, so ideally each one of these little mini cities is gonna have a urban core 
Um, and then housing and whatnot, um, more less density around the edges, but it's all connected by either a train or rapid bus transit. So another shot of transit oriented development, like here you see how there's some roadways that connect that maybe were there originally, but then you can put in a train, a train line that connects things in a different kind of way. Um, so you can still get, um, maintain some separation and cities of reasonable size, but get them all connected. So what would this look like at the scale of the neighborhood? So on the left here, we have what sprawl looks like and on the right, how a neighborhood organized around transit would look. So here you might have a commercial center next to the artery um, and a park that's right off the artery. So it's maybe not the ideal place for a park. And it's hard for people to get around the neighborhood because there's very little grid system going on. There's a lot of cul-de-sacs. School is kind of stuck off to the side, not really in a place, place of prominence. So the transit oriented development design would be, okay, right next to the artery, that's where our commercial center is, but you can have the park kind of be in the center of the community, defining the center of the community and right down the street from say the school. So this area back here would be more residential. This would be more commercial. But one thing is people could accomplish a lot of their errands just within their local neighborhood and not have to get on the main artery. And also you look at the connectivity here is a lot better than it is in the sprawl zone. So this is just kind of rethinking what a neighborhood community could look like. You want to design... Um, Neighborhoods also, so you can both walk and cycle. And there's a lot of um, good thinking out there about how to make uh, people feel safer on a bike. Having specific lanes that are painted a different color helps a lot. Um, and another just design principle is you want to have the public transportation be very attractive. Um, and so here's an example where you can wait for the bus um, undercover um, it's got it, you know, it's stylish, um, and there, you could still have cars, but you're clearly given place of prominence to the buses so that you have, um, people encouraged, um, to take advantage of public transportation and get out of their cars. All right. And then in memoriam to my two dogs that are no longer with me. Um, this was the Dietler and this was Schnitzel. You can tell at this point they were very stressed out about sprawl and just taking a break um, from worrying about it. But they were very good doggies. I have a new dog now named Mabel. She's good. She's a little crazy, but she's a good dog too. All right. I hope you enjoyed and um, hope you uh, learned a little bit about sprawl. All right. Thanks.